evening and welcome to yep. the Fort Smith Athenaeum. We are a non-profit membership library started in 1817. So we are in our 205th year. Mm -hmm. So we are grateful to all of our members for their support. This is not part of our regular lecture series. That starts next Wednesday with a lecture by Dave Maloney. Uh, and I hope you'll all make that one as well. It should be interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, tonight we have proprietor Fred Schubert, who is going to give us a great introduction to a, the history of science. Fred is a former professor at USM. He got his PhD from Adelphi University. He has taught the history of science both in the classroom and remotely. And he is going to give you a very uh, narrow overview of how the 20th century shaped the world. So please welcome Fred Schubert. Okay. As, uh, as Tom said, I taught a course for almost 20 years in history of science, not just at the beginning of the 20th century, but uh, some things just have, have stood out over time. When I started thinking about this uh, talk, I, I had a little broader range of what I wanted to speak of, but it, but it ends up things are so jam-packed uh, during this short period that uh, uh, there's no way I could give a reasonable talk with more than more of this. The emphasis, I, I hope this will be okay for most, is uh, science and technology. This is really things that happened in science and technology that really changed uh, the way we live today. And uh, uh, at least in part, uh, I know this uh, Search to uh, Jim Lalos here in the audience. We've talked about this. He's uh, kind of an expert in his, his career with airlines, and we've talked about how much it's changed since uh, early in the century. So, uh, and I, so a couple of things I want to keep in mind is, is things that happened that really changed the way we live, and also to, to uh, not forget the people involved, the personalities involved. Uh, there are there are some things. Uh, that have to be left out, but, but I think I can give a quick survey here as, as we move along. This intro picture just is Wilbur Wright, 1908, in France, flying over uh, some carriages and horses, but let's actually uh, see if we can get started with this. Uh, first, I will speak a little about flight, and this is a quote of uh, basically uh, someone at the time uh, of the beginning of flight that ranks with man's discovery of, of the use of fire, but whether you feel that way or not, it's, it's certainly a powerful change that occurred. Uh, this notion of uh, the problem of flight, of course, has been around for a long time, and, and, uh, and people felt it, it was going to be difficult to execute. And the easiest way I can bring this up was a talk given in 1890 by an airline, uh, an, excuse me, uh, a flight pioneer named uh, Octav Chanute. He was speaking in 1890 in Cornell, and he described uh, the group that you would have to get together in order to uh, solve this problem of flight. And uh, he said you, you had to have an imaginative inventor, a uh, good mechanical engineer. Uh, you'd have to have uh, someone with a mathematical background, a good mathematical background, just a good old practical mechanic. And finally, you would need a syndicate of uh, capitalists here to provide the needed funds. Now, that, uh, that's an interesting point, because there was another pioneer at the time, Samuel Langley, who was unsuccessful in his attempts to, uh, uh, to get a, a plane flying before the rights. And he ended up uh, being supported by the government to the tune of $50,000, which was a lot of money. You know, That was in those days. Uh, on the other hand, the Wrights, who we know, solved the problem. They were their own capitalists here. They spent $1,000 of their own money on, on the project when, when it finally uh, reached fruition there. Uh, it all began, Wilbur Wright wrote to the Smithsonian Institute. He just wanted to get all the information that they had uh, about the problem of flight. And he hoped, as he said at the end, uh, he said, I hope that I might add uh, my might to help. <laughs> You know, future workers. Uh, humble, serious man. No, no question about it. Now, the Wright, the Wright brothers 
who really ended up being that entire team, uh, just these two guys that Octave Chinook described and felt that would be a, a large group of a dozen or so people working on, uh, on flight. But these two men concentrating on this project day and night uh, over 10 years uh, were able to be successful. Some of the equipment they had, they really, they really uh, uh, worked hard along the way. This is a wind tunnel that they had, bicycle powered, you know, by the way. And uh, this is a balance they used to test different wing designs to see just how much lift they would be able to get. Uh, the important thing is this, that it's something to remember, there are, uh, they kept detailed laboratory notes on these tests. We've got like 1,500 pages of correspondence and contemporary notes of, of the, the Wright brothers. There were, there were other, whenever you do something, uh, you're successful at something, success has a thousand fathers, the old story. So they were haunted by uh, uh, people saying that they were the ones who were the first to, to fly at all. So, uh, I forgot my prop. I had a little plane, but it was like, it was a ten-year-old kid's plane, so I don't think it would help me very much. But uh, so th their project was a ten-year engineering project. The first three years they worked on perfecting uh, their ability to glide, build and and glide as far as they could, and they picked on uh, the Kill Devil Hills area in North Carolina and the Outer Banks because it had a constant high wind. They basically searched all the information on weather in the country. And they had a, a fallow period each year of at least a month or two when not much went on in their bicycle shop in, in Dayton, Ohio, and they could just close the doors and head out there uh, with one of their gliders. Now, uh, it sounds maybe kind of simple, but it was tough in those days to do this. You had to take a train uh, to somewhere in the Carolinas. I don't know how many trains they had to change. In the meantime, they've disassembled their 30-foot long glider and stuff, and they're carrying that with them. And then they would get to a port. They actually had to get on a, a sailing ship to sail to the Outer Banks. There was as yet no bridges. And when they finally reached the Kill Devil Hills area, they still had four miles uh, to walk to carry all their stuff. And then finally, when they got there, they'd set up camp and uh, uh, rebuild their their glider and get and get going and do the test. So now that. Until 1902, they worked on gliders. By 1903, uh, they knew that they would be able to try powered flight. And they knew how much the engine could weigh, and they knew how many horsepower it would have to be in order to lift their plane. I mean, these guys, just the nature of what they were doing, they were daredevils, going up in the glider thousands of times in their planes, thousands of times. We'll see a picture uh, or two later on. You can see where they're, they're risking their lives all the time. But they were extremely careful. Uh, they were definitely, of course, with some accidents, unlikely. But they were, they were a mixture. They, they just to do what they did, they had to be the daredevils we think they were. But the truth is they were extremely conservative, uh, focused, uh, careful engineers. Uh, so the engine, they, they asked a few companies to help them build this engine. They felt it had to be made out of aluminum because it couldn't be too heavy. And they even approached Henry Ford. You know, I'm just imagining uh, what happened then when, when the letter arrived, maybe it, on Henry's desk. We, we need a special engine for our flying machine, which, which uh, I'm not sure how, uh, you know, how far into the letter he might have read. But they had to actually, they had a, knew a good machinist, and they had to make their own engine, basically. Uh, that's, that's really what they did. So and the first powered flight was, uh, was in 1903. Now then, they, they worked the next uh, six years, really, on just getting better at it. Uh, part of the, the problem they saw with the plane was they had to, um, you had to be able to do all this unconsciously, the control of the plane in three dimensions. Just like when you were a kid and you learned to ride a bike, when you first get on the bike, you're falling over, maybe turning it is easy enough, but to believe the gyroscope effect is going to keep you upright and to not have your body tilt too much, it, it just... You have to practice, and all of a sudden you get it, and it's whoops. All of a sudden, sorry about that. All of a sudden you get it, and it, from then on it's automatic. And that's what, how they wanted their flying situation to be. Uh, here's the picture of the of the first flight, successful flight. Uh, Wilbur is kind of a little bit tense as he stands watching as as Orville, who's stretched out prone, uh, just like a bird. They've got him laying in the ground. This plane's about 20 feet long, long by about uh, 40 feet wide or so. That, uh, uh, that that they're using, and and he's he's gotten off the ground, and they uh, they they had uh, okay. They, so we took that picture. We'll go on. Here are the boys, kind of at the height of their power, somewhere on 1910, and uh, 
we have Orville on the left, Wilbur on the right, and uh, <clears throat> the hard working as pair, I ever saw one of the uh, lifeguards at the life stations, life saving station at Bill Devil Hills, just watched them work basically every waking hour for uh, you know for the couple of months they were down there. Uh, sadly, uh, Wilbur only lives a couple more years. He dies of typhoid fever, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the feeling was that that his health was uh, hurt somewhat by all the litigation that they were involved in. And uh, so that when he got typhoid, he, he was not strong enough to survive it. Orville had almost died of typhoid uh, about, you know, years before, 10, 15 years earlier. But uh, this, these are the boys. Uh, mm -hmm. um, now, they had this quandary. They, they knew how to fly their plane, they knew how to build the plane, but they realized that as soon as they showed people their plane, they'd be able to copy it right away. You know, the, the uh, uh, managing the three dimensions. So they, they kind of kept their cards close to the belt here, and they tried to get contracts to sell the plane without really demonstrating it that much, which, they, of course, they got nowhere with that and were accused of being fakes uh, to the point where people didn't really believe they flew. And eventually, in 1908, they, uh, they uh, did a couple of uh, demonstrations here. The first European demonstration, which was done in France, uh, by this time, people weren't sure they could really fly, so they were only about 20 some odd people there, and they were all aviation pioneers uh, from Europe. And they watched uh, Wilbur take off. There was a, you know, th there was a grandstand that uh, they were sitting in, and there was a big copse of trees a little ways away. And as Wilbur took off uh, and headed towards the trees, and then banked and turned and came around and back, they, they realized that uh, they, had, they really didn't understand what the Wrights understood about flying. So these are the comments of the European aviation pioneers at the time. We just don't exist. Uh, he has us all in his hands. And the last uh, comment, which is pretty prophetic, that the fate of nations really is, is in the hands of the information that uh, uh, what Wilbur has figured out. Uh, here are a couple of pictures from the, the Paris trip. Wilbur kind of became the toast of the town. He has the uh, Le Aero cap he's wearing. Here he is actually wearing it over here. And uh, he, I'm not sure what this is supposed to mean. He's flying a bunch of derbies. There's no to Dame in the background. And uh, over here on the right, we have Wilbur talking with uh, King Edward VII. Uh, many of the uh, royal heads of Europe and the military uh, uh, people came to watch these demonstrations. And they had many contract offers after, you know, after these demonstrations. Uh, let's just take a second to do this, because I didn't always understand this myself with flying. We've got the three dimensions we have to worry about. You know, the pitch is just how, how steeply the plane's going to go up, and the yaw would be whether it would go into the left or the right. But the thing that people were missing was that you also had to worry about the roll. In other words, you could take the take off of the plane and... Uh, Sorry, there's nothing to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we got, I won't repeat anything. So the roll, you... Uh, Basically, if there's a little side wind, you can start to roll like this, unless you have a correction that you can make to the wings when, when that starts to happen. And they learned that the hard way. They crashed a few gliders and finally realized that they had to control this roll. To think back when you learned bicycle riding, uh, you didn't have to worry about raising your bike off the ground, but you did have to worry about the roll. That's the thing that's, you know, learning how to ride a bike is learning how to manage the roll, basically. Uh, here's the biggest maybe demonstration that uh, uh, Wilbur Norville did. This is Wilbur flying over the Hudson River. He flew from Governor's Island by the Statue of Liberty all the way up to Grant's tomb and back down again. Uh, along, uh, they said a million people watched. And along the Hudson, they had a number of warships stationed. Because the one thing about uh, Wilbur, he was very careful. In other words, before he, he you couldn't say, well, we're going to take off at 2 o'clock. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. He would go around the plane and check on every single strut and and, and part to make sure he was not going to get killed uh, as he flew the plane. So they, when he finally took off, the pennants were flown from the warships set along the Hudson here, and, and people knew to come out and, and take a look and watch him uh, come up the water. There's a little thing here in this plane that's actually a canoe he has attached to the bottom, you know, in case he, in case he happens to fall into the Hudson. So, um, all right, uh, just a side comment. I, I didn't expect this to, to come, but I was reading about uh, the Battle of Midway. I read about everything that happened in the first 50 years of the century. And uh, this John Keegan, a great military historian, said he felt that going into the, the Battle of Midway, which was the big, crucial, early naval 
uh, battle of the war, that the Americans were at a disadvantage. The Japanese had more carriers ready, more planes to fly, a better fighter plane. But the, uh, he felt that there was a tremendous spirit, uh, the birth, home of the birth of the airplane here, that, that gave the Americans a little bit of a, a plus. And in fact, uh, if you read about the battle, it's actually fascinating. Uh, the, the, it really changed the, the Pacific War in one shot. Now, I kind of thought Keegan was overdoing it with this, but then as I looked at this, uh, this is the head of the Army Air Force. Uh, uh, his uh, name was Hap, Hap Arnold, and he's examining, he's just shown here examining a B-17. The Wright brothers personally taught him how to fly. In other words, this notion that, that the spirit of the Wright brothers was, it was around here as we went into the, you know, World War II in the 40s. Uh, when they first, like many other people with inventions, they, they thought that war would end with airplanes because it meant that you could send reconnaissance people to see what the enemy was doing. There was no such thing as a surprise attack of a big army anywhere because you could, you could watch them with your planes. Uh, and, and he said if you had an evenly balanced enemy, all you would do is wear each other out here, which of course is what they proceeded to do for 52 months in World War I. It's amazing, to think. and not much happened most of that time. Um, he wasn't the only one who thought it would be a peaceful invention. He received, a, they received an award from the French government about that. Uh, all right, let's, uh, I have to be a little careful. Let me move along here. I don't want to shortchange anyone. This is a picture of um, uh, Marie Curie, Madame Curie, and she even recently was voted the most uh, significant uh, person, most inspirational woman in, in all of scientific history. She, working with her husband and on her own, won, won two Nobel Prizes in chemistry and physics. And uh, the key thing for us that we'll talk about a little bit later on is that uh, uh, the work that she did, along with Ernest Rutherford's uh, experiments, showed that atoms of elements were not immutable. Up to that time, from the time Dalton proposed the atomic theory early in the 1800s, the 1900s, they kind of thought that atoms of each element were kind of lumps, unchangeable lumps, and, and the work that the Hurys did showed, no, that they can change, one can change to another, which was very significant. Uh, they also, uh, right away, they were always concerned about uh, medical issues, and they, they, they found out that uh, radium, radiation, radium will uh, preferentially kill cancer cells as opposed to, to normal cells, and the beginnings of radiation therapy were already in their mind, if they were still primitive. Oh, I should, I should mention, she, a young woman, uh, she lived, she grew up in Poland, uh, controlled by Russia. You couldn't go to school there. Women could not go to school. And that's how she ended up in France. First working with uh, Pierre Curie and, then, and then finally marrying him. Here's a picture a little bit later. Sadly, uh, in 1906, uh, in a traffic accident with a horse and wagon, her husband was killed. And she was left a widow with uh, these two young kids. You can kind of see, of course you can read expressions into people, but she's just a, kind of a serious character here. She's got the weight of the world uh, in these, with these two girls on her shoulders, but she still continued to work. Uh, this daughter, Irene, when she grew up, she became a scientist as well, and also won the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about her work. Eve became an author instead, uh, lived to a ripe old age of uh, 104. So, uh, all right, so we've got that. Uh, she lived in Paris in World War I. And the first thing that happened was in the beginning of the war, the, you know, following the great Schlieffen plan, the Germans were sweeping towards Paris. It looked like they were going to make it. And so that uh, Marie uh, evacuated with her children. And unfortunately, she had some radium with her, some of the radium, one of the elements that, that uh, she and Pierre worked with. She had one gram. But to carry that one gram anywhere, she needed 50 pounds of lead around it. So she had this little parcel. She's not, not a big woman. She's carrying this on the train. Has to be sitting with her all the time. She can't, you know, let it out of her sight. And uh, after a while, it was clear after the Battle of the Marne that the, 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 the Germans were not going to make it into Paris, at least in the, in, the early, in the early days of the war. So she returned to Paris. She felt Paris was her adopted country. They treated her so well compared to the life that she would have had if she, she had stayed in Poland. That she wanted to do something. She knew a lot about x-rays from her teaching. And uh, so she felt that there were some, uh, several uh, uh, x-ray uh, installations in hospitals, but they were very large. So she thought she could set up a portable uh, x-ray unit that could travel around the front and uh, help out with wounded soldiers. Uh, here she is 
driving, you know, in the driver's seat of uh, one of these units. She set up 150 of them. In the process, she learned how to drive, which was a no-no in those days for a woman. She also trained her 150 other women uh, how to drive. Uh, she also learned auto mechanics. She could change tires. This, this woman could do anything, basically. Uh, driving around the front, these, these uh, units were very common, and the soldiers affectionately uh, labeled them little curies. And uh, they, they certainly helped out in the war. Now, she said the, the doctors really, we can't imagine this today, but they didn't see that x-rays were very important in the beginning. But uh, the Battle of the Somme, which was a gigantic battle, created so many casualties that, that the fact that we had an, they had another diagnostic tool available to help with the wounded, uh, she said they, they found the doctors finally really integrated x-rays into, into, their, into their work. Uh, this one last uh, picture. This is the American Expeditionary Force in 1918. She's training them. Uh, she's here. There's her daughter, Irene. And uh, they, between the 150 mobile units and the 50 hospital units that she set up, they took uh, over a million images uh, of, you know, of wounded soldiers. So this is a very dramatic thing. Now, there's kind of a, another element of the story. In 1995, it was decided to move uh, the remains of Marie and her husband Pierre to the uh, Pantheon in, in Paris, where all the important uh, French uh, lights, so to speak, are interred. And uh, they were worried about Marie because see, she worked with radiation enough that if you went into her lab, uh, her lab books were radioactive. You know, the, the room was, the drawers were, the, the books were, so they were a little afraid that her remains would be radioactive because, uh, uh, and they, they prepared uh, equipment to help them with moving the body. Uh, however, it was not, that her remains were not radioactive, which was good for the men doing that job, but it was bad in another way because it implied that the cancer that she, the leukemia, which they feel uh, she got as a result of the uh, work with uh, radioactive material, really occurred from uh, the X-radiation from the First World War. She was careful, but this X-ray stuff was brand new, and she wasn't careful enough. Uh, sadly, her daughter also ended up getting cancer and dying uh, at a young age. Marie lived into her 60s, and Irene died at, at 58. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, finally, we have a picture here of uh, Marie with Einstein. He said she was the, the, the person who was least affected by fame of, of anybody he, he met. In fact, there was a gold drive by the Bank of France during the war to help pay for the, for the war. She came in with two <laughs> Nobel Prize medals and held it down. But the, the bank refused, refused to take them in. So, uh, and her daughter said that when she, she got so much joy out of just training her X-ray, portable X-ray people, she said she got as much joy out of that as she did out of, out of really important, significant experiments. Uh, remarkable woman, remarkable woman. Uh, uh, here's one that's a little less about uh, interesting personalities here, but uh, Europe, at the turn of the century, there really was a food crisis, some, to some degree a land uh, crisis. So for whatever political reasons people might have come to America, they, they, they came to uh, find a place where they could grow food and eat and, and, and be better off than, than they had been before. And the big problem was uh, there was not enough fertilizer to create the food to feed the, the population that was still growing. So scientists were trying to figure out a way around that, and they looked to the atmosphere, which is full of nitrogen, to see if they could make nitrates out of the nitrogen in the air. And uh, it took a long while, but in the early 1900s, uh, two scientists, Fritz Haber and, and Carl Bosch, figured out a way to do it. And uh, by uh, 1913 or so, they actually had a plant that made this. Now, this is so important that as you sit here, now half the nitrogen in your body uh, right now is, is made by, by the Haber process. It's just uh, uh, extremely important. In fact, the other way to look at this is, is our population, you know, roughly today here was over 7 billion or so. The feeling is that we would never have gone over 3 billion if we didn't have the Haber process or, or some equivalent. It was really something. Out of all the things we talk about tonight, this, this had the biggest effect on, uh, on the world. Uh, now, here's the guy. He looks a, a little sinister, and, and perhaps he should. The, uh, let's see. Uh, because not only can we make fertilizer, here we can also make 
uh, bullets and bombs with the same nitrogen compounds. In other words, nitrates you need for fertilizer, nitrates you need for bullets and bombs. So if uh, Germany didn't have the Haber process, the war, if there were a First World War, and there might not have been, to be honest with you, but they couldn't afford for more than six months with what they had on hand. Because normally, the way they got their nitrates, they, they sent a ship across the Atlantic, went to Chile, and came back to, uh, to Germany with, with the nitrates to use. Now, that was all well and good, but once the war started, the British Navy was not going to let them go to Chile. So uh, either they had to make their nitrogen compounds uh, at home, or the war would be over in a few months. So as it turned out, uh, of course, it, it lasted. Instead of running out of bullets, they kind of ran out of people after a while to die. So um, he was somewhat of a hero, but he, he was the one who thought of using poison gas in the war. He started the ball rolling on this. Now, the Allies ended up using it as well as the Germans, but uh, he's considered to be the guy who really instigated it and got it rolling. Uh, so uh, when the war ended um, and things were coming back to normal again, they they were going to award him the Nobel Prize for the Haber process, but some people, you know, there was a big uh, to-do that maybe he should be tried as a war criminal instead, so Prince Haber. <laughs> Sad story in a way, his wife was very upset about him uh, sponsoring poison gas. She committed suicide, so it was not, not a happy time for him. Also, he was Jewish, but he actually converted, but that didn't help when Hitler came to power. Once Hitler came to power, he was just ostracized uh, completely and died and died uh, not long afterwards. Uh, here's one that has a little bit of science in it, but I just think this is, this is uh, important enough that we have to mention. We, we were all experienced with pan pandemics now, but people, you know, weren't for a long time. And uh, a lot of the measures that we used this time around were uh, because of the experience of, of the 1918 flu. And I, I have what's like, they call us the tale of two cities here, just, just to give us some idea of what went on. Uh, one is Philadelphia in blue. Uh, cases started up in Philadelphia, and the f city fathers simply ignored it. Let's go on. All our parades, the shows, whatever we're doing, and the, uh, the wave rose so quickly that everything was overwhelmed. The undertakers were overwhelmed. Uh, the hospitals were completely overwhelmed. People would keep their dead loved ones in their house until they smelled so bad they had to leave them out on the street. It was like an awful time, basically an awful time. And uh, whereas the second city, St. Louis, uh, hearing some of the horror stories from Philadelphia, they closed things down. No, no gatherings, people should stay home. And uh, so they, they had a lot of cases, but at least their systems, their medical systems and everything else would still, they just weren't overwhelmed. This was something they didn't want to have happen. Well, this, this same thing happened out on the Western Front. The Germans in 1918 were gathering uh, colossal numbers of soldiers, millions of soldiers for their last big offensive that they thought would win the war, and uh, over a half a million of them ended up uh, getting the flu. Because once you get an army of a million or so together, there's no social distancing, there's no way to, to prevent people from interacting. Everybody who's going to get sick gets sick. And so you not only had this half million here that was sick, the people around them had to take care of them too. So the feeling is that the thrust, the big thrust they had in 1918, was kind of crippled even, even before it started uh, because of this uh, pandemic. So, uh, <clears throat> Oswald Avery is this uh, scientist kind of out of central casting. He looks like a nice, <laughs> friendly guy here. And, uh, some of these little pictures. But uh, scientists did a lot of work in 1918 to try to counteract the flu. The key thing that they discovered was that uh, pneumonia is what killed everybody. You got sick with flu, and that set the stage for you to get pneumonia. Almost every corpse they examined had the pneumonia uh, microbes in it. So they set out to try to find a serum. They did many experiments to do this, and, and they, weren't, they weren't successful. But uh, Avery noticed one of the experiments as, uh, as being uh, particularly interesting, at least to him. And I'll see if I can describe this to you um, and, uh, without giving away the story. So we have... There are two main kinds of pneumonia that we run into. One is relatively benign, and one is extremely lethal. R, I'm calling a benign one, R star is lethal. So what they did was kind of, uh, take all kinds of mixtures of the dead uh, bacteria, they you know, deactivated them and tried that for serums, didn't work. So 
But one of the experiments they did along the way was they took live benign pneumonia, let's call it benign pneumonia, and they mixed it with dead, deadly pneumonia. The, the line through this is to indicate it's dead. Again, we've just got bits and pieces of this stuff. And, and when they put these two together, and they took a look after a day or two, it was all full of the deadly pneumonia, live. Somehow, information from the dead pneumonia, genetic information, was making its way into the uh, benign pneumonia and converting it into uh, dangerous stuff. And so this is what Avery wanted to understand. Now, uh, as the pandemic ended, his fellow workers kind of went away from looking at pneumonia again. The pandemic's over, there's always a new medical problem if you look around the world, and he was kind of left in the corner, and he, and he kind of thought that he was, uh, his compatriots kind of thought he was losing his touch, he's approaching 60, there's a famous rule, uh, don't let anybody over 60 into the laboratory, they might, of course, make somebody sick or hurt someone. So uh, uh, it, it isn't always true, but to some extent, uh, uh, you know, there is some truth to it. Well, so he said, no, I'm going to stick with this. I think I've got to understand this one experiment. So if we, we think ourselves, when we think of diet, we think uh, of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And this is supposed to stand for a bacteria, uh, you know, an ammonia bacteria of our star. Now what he did, besides the three things we usually associate with diet, we've also got uh, RNA, nucleic acid, and, and DNA. So what he said was, I think one of these five elements is, or components, is going to be the thing that's, that's uh, uh, passing on the genetic information. So he worked, this sounds simple, I can describe it to you in one minute, but this was over 10 years of work for him to do this. Because the amounts that we're working with are minuscule, and then when you look at the, the nucleic acids, it's minuscule of minuscule you're talking about uh, to, to look at this. So what he first did was he just, they thought it was going to be in the protein, so he he first deactivated everything else except the proteins, and that didn't pass on any information. And then he went through all of these, and finally he found out it was DNA. And uh, he published that, that uh, this, this biochemical statement that DNA carries the hereditary information. Well, this is a pretty revolutionary thing. On, on the one hand, the older biologists were not that interested in this whole thing of genetics. In fact, some, some people say, he, he published this information and everybody went, yeah, you know, which, which was not, that well, was true maybe for older biologists, but not for the younger biologists. Biology had this group coming in that had training in uh, chemistry and physics, uh, all because of a book written by a scientist named Erwin Schrodinger called What is Life? And uh, they felt that, that there was some molecule or collection of molecules that, that really governed uh, life and, and uh, the information that gets passed on. So they were interested in this. Now the bad news for Avery was that that year the Nobel Committee was considering giving him the Nobel Prize for other work he had done. But they felt that if they gave him the Nobel Prize now, everyone would say, oh, the uh, Nobel Committee thinks that DNA is the, is the hereditary material. And they were scared to, to make that jump because they wanted to see more experiments that, that showed the same thing. Why, why did they want to do that? Well, as quickly, early on, when Nobel set up the award, he kind of wanted it to be yearly, like Times Man of the Year or Woman of the Year or something. Uh, what happened lately? Now, what, what ha happens, there are a couple of things. Maybe in 1905, what you thought was hot stuff, nobody cares about in 1915. So maybe it's not such a good idea to do this. Further, they had a horrible thing happen during the 20s. A scientist came up with a structure for the molecule cholesterol, and that work was very complicated, went on a long time, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize. Well, a year later, they found out he was wrong. Okay. <laughs> so from then on, they tended to take the, this career view. We want something that, that's been around for a while, and people believe it, and it's been reconfirmed for 10 years or so. So uh, he ended up never getting the Nobel Prize, which was unfortunate, because he certainly did the work. The last thing, I have some comments. These are. These are Nobel Prize winners. Once the 1950s came, most of the awards in physiology and medicine involved uh, referring back to Avery's DNA work. So here are some comments here. He, he gave us a new language. Avery gave us a new language. Uh, the dark ages of DNA uh, ended in 1944. He basically invented the field of molecular biology, which is really what biology has been for the last 70, 80 years or so. And then finally, uh, Linus Pauling, a double Nobel winner, just to put it very succinctly, 
DNA is the master molecule. And all of this came out of the pandemic research from 1918. Uh, all right, we've got uh, Colossus here that we want to talk about. Colossus is a computer, first mm -hmm. digital computer. Tommy Flowers uh, in 1943 essentially uh, made, set up this computer himself, designed it, and set the whole thing up. Here he is at 90 in front of it. They saved uh, saved it from the war. It's like in a museum, but this is this is uh, the, the first digital computer that mm -hmm. came along, and, and he basically he alone uh, deserves the credit for for doing this. Now, uh, let's see if I can move along. We've all probably heard of Enigma somewhere else if we've just watched the uh, the imitation game with Benedict Cumberbatch or something. Like that. We've probably heard at least of Enigma, but the Germans gave up Enigma and set up a more complicated machine. Uh, called the Lorentz machine in 1943, and all the, the stratagems for working with Enigma were just kind of out of the way. They knew they had to build some new machinery, and most of the people in charge uh, came from Cambridge University, and they had it in mind to, to use some kind of mechanical system to make a, a new machine. Now, uh, Flowers said that they're really off the wall, it's the wrong thing to do, but uh, he spoke with this Cockney taxi driver accent, so it's a little hard to convince a Cambridge guy that you're, you know, that you're the one who knows what he's talking about. So he wanted to make something with 5,000 tubes, and uh, that people thought he was crazy essentially by doing this. Uh, he wasn't. He had some some good reason for doing that, which I'll set aside, and somebody I can explain it later to to, to those who might want to know. But uh, there were some who thought he didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, Came, uh, excuse me, Bletchley Park uh, uh, people after the war, looking back, felt that this is the one time the collegiality that was usually there broke down. That this whole notion that, that the Cambridge guys are going to be told by the son of a bricklayer what they should do uh, was not something that, that they could do. So he went back to work. He, he worked at the post office and phone company. They were, the post office was in charge of the phone company in those days. And they thought so highly of him, they just said, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. So uh, he made this uh, machine, which is called Colossus, and they, he delivered it back to uh, Bletchley Park, and uh, they did a test. They gave an old message that had been decoded, but it had taken about a week to decode it. And in just a couple of minutes, Colossus printed out the answer in perfect German. You know, it had to be translated. Now, they didn't believe this. They thought it was some kind of trick. So uh, they made him do the same one again, because they knew their machine was not consistent enough to ever give the same results two times in a row. And of course, Colossus printed out the same result. Also, it was working 500 times faster than, uh, than the, uh, the Big Cheese's machine. So they basically uh, made, as the war went on, they made 16 of these, and they were able to keep up with the uh, flow of messages, thousands of messages that were coming from the Germans. And they pretty much read everything. Uh, I could give you one, you know, one case in point was uh, uh, that I just kind of, I felt a little chilling. This, uh, this translator went to the keyboard and the message was printed out from Colossus and it was in German and she had it translated, but she didn't have to translate it to read the name at the bottom of the, uh, you know, of the, of the message, uh, Adolf Hitler Fuhrer. They were really pretty much reading everything. So they had to be careful when they did this, of course. Be, the Germans could eventually realize that, that somebody was, you know, knew too much. In fact, uh, Erwin Rommel kind of right away knew something was wrong. He would keep sending this message back to central headquarters, OKW, whatever. Uh, he said, somebody's reading my mail. That's what, that's what he said. So uh, also Admiral Donitz, the submarine uh, admiral, he realized something was wrong, the way the ships were moving around too, with too much purpose, really. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention all the things that happened. The feeling is that Colossus shortened the war at least by a year, at least by a year. But uh, the American troops, there was a big airborne landing uh, at a certain spot on D-Day, and they found out that there were going to be there was almost a division worth of German troops right at that point. So they simply moved it somewhere else. But there were many things like this that happened. Uh, the Germans kept changing the settings, but Colossus could, could keep up with it. Now let me just see if I can, if I can you know, we're all not programmers, so let me just see if I can just give you an idea of what I mean. This is my phone, uh, my phone like the old days. The first phone I had was a flip phone. It was really good at making phone calls, but that's what it did. Now the phone I have today, uh, like it or not, uh, uh, has many, uh, I've got to get this, 
see if I can get this up for you. I put all these little icons on here for apps that, that, that you can run. Now, right now, there's some high school whiz kid uh, sitting in his room. You know, he gave up playing video games, and he's writing a new app to do something I didn't even know I needed to do that I'm, that I'm probably going to buy next week or at least download. And, and I'll be able to put it in the same phone. In other words, this phone can be programmed. It isn't focused on a particular task and locked into that task. And that was really the point of, of his making this uh, Colossus program. It made it much harder. The machine was more complicated to make, but that was really what, uh, what he had to do here. So uh, eventually he got some credit. Here, here he is in the museum. There, there are a bunch of other uh, characters there, but there, there are a few things to, uh, uh, about this that we, well, the official secrets act in Britain is so extreme that, number one, as soon as the war ended, they destroyed almost all the Colossus computers instead of keeping them to use. They kept a couple just in case of what, I don't know, but we also couldn't talk about it. And uh, they went on using it really until the early 60s, uh, grabbing some Soviet messages and, and using it to help them translate those. Uh, and, and once at a press conference, uh, some reporter raised their hand and said, how did you know, how was that uh, stuff translated? How did you figure that out? Well, uh, the answer by the government official was, well, the Americans helped us. See. Rather than say, we figured it out ourselves with the computer that one of our people actually developed was something that they, they just weren't going to do. Uh, there's also some feeling that, you know, as the war ended, all those Cambridge people that uh, Flowers was battling at, at Bletchley Park started to run the country. So. You, you never forget, even though Flowers was right, and even though his machine helped, he was still telling them they were wrong. And that's something that, that people sometimes get, just never forget. He actually received an award, a very low-level uh, award from the British government of a thousand pounds, and he spent more than that himself trying to make this uh, computer. Uh, briefly, I, I want to mention something about the leaders in science here. Gosh, I've got to, let's see if we can do this. Uh, the idea is this, we'll go through the Hitler, uh, Churchill, and Churchill called the Wizard War. Churchill felt that the technological war, whoever won that, was going to win the whole war. Now he had at his side Frederick Lindemann, a physicist, and he talked to him all the time. Uh, uh, Churchill was not uh, a scientific expert by any means, you know, he could, uh, be both, but he was willing to listen, and he wanted to hear when things were going on, and wanted to understand what was happening. On the other hand, we have Hitler, according to Speer, his uh, you know, minister of armaments, Hitler didn't really want to talk about much about new stuff. If anything, he said he might want to know what he called a Sunday supplement uh, <laughs> version of, of, of something. And, and said Speer would sometimes come in and he'd say, oh, well, my, uh, my driver, he told me about that. I know about that already. He didn't want to hear Speer's detailed account of something. My photographer told me about this. So, so Hitler was not interested. He was uh, distrustful. Of, of all innovations uh, that were like the, the jet plane and even discussing something like the atom bomb, Hitler was not interested. If, if it, he had a first, he was set from being a, a trench soldier in the First World War, and that's the way he saw the world. Um, in fact, one of his generals said, this was, it came out in another way, that he used to see the lines on the map where the armies were as some kind of fixed thing, whereas uh, in, in modern warfare, you want to see those as kind of fuzzy. You can move a few thousand men this way and that way. We can advance or, or go forward and, and be mobile. But he saw it the way it was in World War I, where the lines didn't change for years. And uh, he was not about to change. Um, so military perspectives. The old German, uh, the arrogance here, the quality of leadership and equipment was going to dominate, win out the day. But Stalin, who had more uh, sense here, quantity is its own quality. And uh, he basically defeated the German army, you know. Uh, in fact, it's argued, I just finished a book by uh, Max Hastings, and he said, if the, if the Allies didn't invade Italy, if they didn't have D-Day, Stalin was going to be Hitler. You know, once he had him on the run, it might have taken him longer, but, but, but there was no way, you know. Uh, so, yeah, once it became clear Russia would survive in 1941, some of his uh, leaders came and said, you can't win militarily. You got to do something else. So, Hitler's, this is a quote they give a couple of guys. How then shall I end this war? Well, they suggested the negotiation. He was still going to war. We're the Aryan race. We can beat everyone. We're the best. So he was not about to sit around the table and try to negotiate bits and pieces. 
uh, about what happened here. And this, well, let me just mention this. If you, in, in the case of the Long War, the Germans were in deep trouble. There's a little bit of a shift here when I load on this computer. But, but the GDP ratio of uh, UK, USA, and USSR was much greater than the Germans. The Germans, in the Lightning War, if they beat you before you got set, they could win. But once the war was going to turn to a long slog, uh, they were in deep trouble. Guderian, uh, the great tank commander, went to Hitler to try to explain this. He said, we're having these tank battles, and uh, we're losing a lot of tanks, they're losing a lot of tanks, but they can build them faster than we can. So we're, we're going to lose if this keeps going on. So Hitler's response was, why don't you tell me this before we start at this? <laughs> uh, there was one, one last thing here that, for me as a scientist, so the, the great German science establishment, which took 100 years to build, uh, say by 1940, the Nobel Prizes, we have Germany 34, the U.S. 12, uh, Great Britain 16, but uh, the Germans dominated the scene. Uh, the, the amount of work published in Germany, it builds up. It's been coming along in the 19th century, but it really builds up until 1929. The, uh, you know, the, uh, the Depression comes on, and then things fall down. Hitler comes to power, uh, the war starts, and, and it really falls to zero. By the end of the war, the entire scientific establishment uh, that, as I said, it took a hundred years to build, uh, disappeared. Uh, we have, I have here, I want to show President Eisenhower, having dealt with the humans, uh, the Germans, and knew all the technical uh, know-how that they had, he understood how important it was in the war to be ahead technologically. This is his science advisory committee. And this wasn't a smile and then go home committee. He was talking to these people. He wanted to know what was happening, because he knew that the only way the United States could stay uh, as a preeminent power is to have its science and technology uh, at a tip-top place. So, um, let's see, Marconi, <coughs> Battle of Britain. Let me see how if I can do this here. I want to make sure I get through everything. I think I can. Let's see uh, what's going on here. You know, this is a laser, Don. You have to I didn't realize that. Um, okay, in 1880, German, Heinrich Hertz did an experiment. He had a, a machine that could generate sparks. Think of this, that rectangle is just a big machine that generates sparks. And what he found in his laboratory, that if he made a big spark over here, and he just put a little ring of wire that, that wasn't connected at the end, in other words, a ring that was broken, there would be a little spark there. In other words, big spark, little spark. Apparently, a little bit of the power from the big machine was getting working its way through the air to the little machine. Uh, and he did a, a lot of work with this, which we will not discuss. Someone who did observe it was Mar uh, Marconi, and he immediately saw, this is a way maybe we can communicate. So you can see he's kind of got a spark machine and receiver from, from a couple of decades later. But uh, he set out to see just how far he could actually do this thing with the spark. Let's see, let's see how it gets. And he got 30 miles, he got 60 miles, and finally in 1901 he was able to send a message from Newfoundland to the British Isles. And uh, soon after that, uh, Teddy Roosevelt sent greetings to the king, and he sent them back. And, and it was a really, uh, a really big story. Uh, and it was the, the beginning of, of wireless communication. Uh, early, in the early days, um, Marconi built a big station out on the Cape in a well fleet. Uh, some people walking around, but he started to run into trouble. Turns out the bigger the, bigger the spark you make here in uh, the USA, the bigger the spark you'll be able to see you know, two or three thousand miles away. <clears throat> but it makes a lot of noise. It starts to sound like lightning. <laughs> so uh, the people who lived around this station were all upset and he was kind of restricted to a couple of hours a day. And it, it, it looked like this whole wireless thing might just be a flash in the pan. But then uh, we came to a night in uh, April night in 1912 and uh, at the Marconi station at the top of the John Wanamaker department store in New York City, uh, was a man named David Sarnoff, uh, and he was uh, listening, and he picked up uh, messages not directly from the Titanic, but the Titanic sent messages to Newfoundland, where the big station was that could go across the ocean, and that rebroadcast the information that the Titanic had actually uh, struck an iceberg. So he actually had that information in New York the night that it occurred, mm -hmm. and it was in the papers the next day. Uh, it was really a big deal. Now, he had two other workers with him, he called them in, and they basically stayed there 24 hours a day. They finally connected with the Carpathia, the rescue, the rescue ship, 
and they actually got a list of names of all the survivors, mm. and they had that list before mm. the ship ever, ever came in. Mm. So all of a sudden now, wireless was important. Within a month or two, Congress had already passed the law. It says that if, you, if the ship's above a certain size, have to have a Marconi station on them, they have to have a trained operator, <clears throat> and that was kind of the beginning of, of, of the importance of wireless. Now, uh, let, me see, let me just tell you about this. Uh, my gosh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to, to, to lose everything. But uh, let's just say, last thing, uh, there was a lot more that had to be done uh, because we, we. I used to think when my mother told me the story when I was a kid that that he was there with his earphones and then he heard beep 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 beep, beep. but it wasn't that way at all. It turned out every hobbyist and his brother was building a big spark generating machine and had a receiver. So when you put on your earphones, you heard this cacophony <laughs> of Morse code signals coming from all over. And a lot of them with disinformation and misinformation. The whole thing was just a, was just a mess. It took a while before we ended up developing the circuits that allowed us to, say, pick 100 megacycles as a particular station or, or 90 whatever, 98.3, whatever you might listen to. That, that, that actually took a while. But wireless was suddenly important. Um, I, I wanted to give one example, to, uh, uh, which I can cover pretty quickly. This scientist was, was trying to use uh, radio waves to study weather, you know, to, to, to predict the weather. And he would send a, a radio wave signal out to a cloud bank, and a lot of it would bounce back <coughs> from the cloud bank. And he could just then tell, oh, the cloud is so far away, and, there's a big formation coming, the, you know, the weather's changing. And he realized he was following the news, so Hitler was in charge, and he was worried that Britain was going to be at war soon. So he approached the, uh, the government and said, I think I have a way for you to detect planes from many, many miles away. They did a test, and in fact, it proved to be correct. And by the beginning of the war, he had set up a bunch of stations. This is the mark where the radar signal uh, actually comes out you know, into the water. Whenever, let's say, a German bomber comes in here, as soon as it reached this point, uh, a signal would then be uh, sent back to the main station where they kept track of all the stuff. And it kind of allowed the British, in a sense, to survive the Battle of Britain because they're, they're, it was as if they had two or three times as many fighter planes as they really had because they could direct them to exactly where the bombers were. And, uh, and of course, they survived the Battle of Britain. But this was a key element in that, so I picked that. Um, all right, the antibiotics. Uh, I can't tell. Let's see how I can <laughs> see how I can uh, pin this down. Um, all right, here's uh, I've got a petri dish here, and this petri dish, uh, what's done? They've actually come along with a brush and brushed a whole bunch of bacteria on here. It looks like the brush marks, and then they put four little pieces of filter paper that have antibiotic on them. And then they just let this petri dish sit for a couple of days. And what you can tell from this uh, is these three antibiotics don't do much uh, to kill bacteria, but this one, which happens to be Cipro, will kill this staph bacteria. So it's, it's you know, a common test that, that you would do today. Well, the first test like this was done by accident. Uh, it ended up that Sir Alexander Fleming was going away for a weekend, and he tossed all his dirty glassware in the sink, but one of the petri dishes was sticking out of the sink. And uh, it was only partly immersed. Uh, the window behind the sink was open, and uh, a little bit of mold flew in and settled in his open petri dish. The temperature also dropped because of the open window, which helped the mold grow. And uh, he had a couple of days that he was away. So this thing had a chance. It's not going to develop instantaneously. But when he came back and went over to his sink, instead of just pushing the petri dish in, he lifted it out. In other words, he had a spot just like this. With, it was the, with the no bacteria, and he realized the significance of it, and uh, they identified penicillin, and uh, uh, things went along. They realized it killed bacteria, but they couldn't get a lot of it. The mold didn't generate but millions of a gram of it. Uh, they still wanted to test it, so during the 30s, they kind of, by way of the mold, they got enough of it to uh, check the toxicity with, of human beings, and it seemed to be okay on that score, uh, but they kind of hoarded a teeny bit. Uh, of the stuff, but uh, a small, a young girl who was uh, two years old and dying slowly of a, a terrible infection ended up being the topic of a news story that, that came up. And that reporter following this slowly dying child 
found out about the government hiding or holding on to a little bit of penicillin. And he set a one-man campaign up that finally convinced them that they would use their store of penicillin to treat the girl. And she, she was cured very, very quickly. Uh, still, nothing more happened until the war starts. Once the war starts, the pocketbooks open up, and uh, many different attempts were, were made to make penicillin. Uh, one of them involved uh, a uh, fermentation method by a small company in Brooklyn. This, is, this happens to be just a specimen thing. But the small company was interested in this, particularly because the person in charge of research had a daughter who died slowly of an infection at age six, and no one could help her. This was earlier. So he just wanted to get into this penicillin. Uh, and uh, the name of that, the company was uh, Pfizer. <laughs> now, uh, uh, there was enough by the time of D-Day, we had enough uh, penicillin to treat everyone. Now, chemists aren't happy unless they know what the molecule looks like. And this very, very nice lady, Dorothy Hodgkin, uh, set to work to figure this out, along with many, many other scientists and other teams. And she came up with this three-dimensional structure. We don't really care exactly what these details are. But she was doubted. The, the bigger teams of scientists said, oh, it's not, that's not the right answer, but it turned out it was. Uh, she was generally always right. She also figured out the structure for insulin and vitamin B12. And, and she went to uh, a famous scientist in England and, and said, uh, now that I've got this stuff, do you think I'll, I'll be elected to the Royal Society in England? And, and he said, you know, gee, Dorothy, I, I don't think that we can do that. You know, it's a men's club. They're, they're not going to change. He said, but I'll get you a Nobel Prize. Which he did. And she, so he did win a Nobel Prize. But even then, yeah, the headline in the Daily Man, Mail was, Housewife Wins Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> not great, you know, not brilliant scientist wins Nobel Prize. Now, why we want to know the structure, this is your, your chemistry lesson for the day. Here's standard penicillin. Now, the, the bacteria are very, very wily. They can keep changing all the time. So what we find is that uh, if they be, develop resistance to penicillin G, if we chemically add some agent here, we're at the arrow, that just changes it a little bit, it fakes the bacteria out, at least for a few thousand generations before they get wise. So this is ampicillin. So there's a whole bunch of cillins. And if you look at them, they're all going to look like penicillin G with little modifications. And, uh, you know, this, this is what we do. Unfortunately, because we overuse for antibiotics, we're, we're really going to be in trouble. All right, let's see if I can do this in, in two minutes here. Uh, the Adam story. The, uh, now we change the world. Okay. Now, the senior Curies actually uh, worked on radium, and uh, they found out that the radium atom changed by throwing off a little chunk so that atoms weren't immutable anymore, as I mentioned before. But the younger Curies, uh, Irene, actually took this, set up an experiment where she could throw this injection material at another atom and hit it. And she hit aluminum, and the aluminum turned into phosphorus. It actually absorbed that little particle in the nucleus and gave off a neutron. This is the first artificial uh, radioactive, radioactive isotope that was made. Now, these radio artificial isotopes turn out to be very important because the whole idea of nuclear medicine, which is well developed today, is based on the fact that we can make uh, radioactive versions of elements if we, if we need to. So, uh, that's it. Oh, here we go. Here's a, here's a periodic table. Now that we're throwing things at an atom and changing it to another atom, uh, this is what she, they did. They threw at aluminum, they threw something and turned it into phosphorus. But then we come down to the end here. Here's uranium. The last element. This is a 1925 table. What's going to happen if you throw something at uranium? Mm -hmm. We don't know what's going to happen. It's like uh, on beyond zebra. Any of the kids, did you read the Dr. Seuss book? You know, what letter comes after Z? Well, what, what happens after oh. when you throw something at uranium? Well, they tried, and they got uh, some strange results. Uh, instead of getting a big atom, it turned out the whole thing just broke in half. We had nuclear fission with a tremendous amount of energy given off. Now, it wasn't obvious. Explaining this experiment wasn't obvious, but this woman, Liza Meiner, who had been thrown out of the lab in Germany by the Nazis and was now in Sweden, uh, was corresponding with her old lab mate who was still back in Germany and did this experiment. And she looked things over and figured it out, okay? Uh, so, how would Einstein be known? This is Leo Szilard. And uh, Leo Szilard had won another step. And what he did was he looked over these results that Meitner figured out. And he said, you know, if three of these neutrons each hit another uranium atom, they could make that, those break apart. And then you could do nine, the 27. So if you jam enough uranium together in one lump, 
you may be able to get an explosion. So uh, they were worried that the Nazis might do this because they knew they had already corralled uh, uranium. So uh, Leo Szilard knew everybody knew Einstein, and he had he carried a lot of eminence, even though he was older. Uh, Szilard wrote the letter. Einstein signed it. It was sent to uh, Washington, and. Uh, uh, let's see what now, both of these guys, you can't tell, they're scared to death here. They were afraid of Hitler. Einstein uh, left Germany, didn't come back after 1933, but he had already been, kind of been abused and stuff by the Nazis. I won't go into the detail. And Szilard was uh, a refugee from, from Hungary. So, so these guys are frightened. They were pacifists, but they knew how horrible Hitler was. And so they wrote to appeal to, uh, to President Roosevelt to start working on this project. Well. Now let this be the, the, the last the last anecdote uh, to to finish the whole thing. Um, they couldn't bring in this heavy science stuff to FDR. FDR was a politician. He always talked in circles. Often you never knew what he meant. He was just one of the best of the best. Even even his assistants didn't know often uh, exactly what he meant. So, but they they drafted uh, a man named Alexander Sachs, who had worked uh, for uh, Roosevelt in his first administration. And he could get an audience with Roosevelt just out of friendship. And they gave him the letter. So he bought the letter, which is kind of, if you try to read it, it's really kind of weighty and everything. So he bought that letter and his version of the letter in a folder into the office and sat down to talk to FDR. You know, how are you, Alexander? It's a good old times. And, and uh, Sachs sat back and I said, Mr. President, I have to tell you a parable, a story. And uh, it's about Napoleon. Napoleon! FDR said, you know, we've just gotten some Napoleon brandy in here. <laughs> so they sent out the Napoleon brandy came in. They both shared a glass and uh, said, well, the, well his, when Napoleon was uh, fighting against the British, uh, he received a letter from an American. And the American said, if you want to fight England, I can build the ships that will allow you to do it. You'll be able to go wherever you want in England, whenever you want to, without sails. So Napoleon looks at this, this letter and says, what are you doing sending me cranks like this? You know, he's yelling at all his, uh, his court. I don't want to hear from these visionaries. You know, I have work to do. So he just didn't listen to what Robert Fulton had to say. <laughs> he just didn't listen. So now Alexander Sachs says, look, Mr. President, I've got information here in this folder about a weapon that will change the nature of war. Uh, explosives of super high intensity. And uh, I think it's important that we do something about it. The Nazis are already cornering uh, the uranium, and they're starting work on the project. So uh, FDR puts down his glass. I see, Alex. So you're saying you don't want the Nazis to drop this thing on us, right? And he says, yes, Mr. President, yes. So that was it. He gave him the stuff and left. Uh, I, I could tell you more about the story, but of course, we all know what happened with the Manhattan Project. Let me stop now. I kind of. Overstayed my welcome here. I was trying to stay within an hour, but I apologize for going too far. Thank you very much. I can answer questions, or everybody's probably hungry enough. They don't. I feel like my dealing with my field. Yes, yes. My my father was a physician, and he was with the Second General Hospital during World War II. And that was one of the major teaching hospitals out of New York and had a unit. And uh, they did the first penicillin trials. My father wrote the history and he, he told me uh, years ago that he said that uh, we, we gave massive doses. We didn't know what doses to use. And, and because of that, it saved so many people. We gave these doses and the next day people would be revived. And, and it was just a miracle that, you know, growing up in sulfur drugs and moving to Penicillin, he said it was just an amazing, amazing experience. Yeah. And that, that all, those trials all came from Merck. They all, oh, really? Merck Sharp and Dome at the time. Yeah, yeah. okay. okay. Um, great. It was certainly a miracle drug. Still a miracle drug. Yeah, yeah. But it's struggling now to fight the bacteria. Okay. All right, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question, question from Tom Watson. Oh, uh, this sort of a postscript on, on your yeah. talk on the airplane, the development of, of airplane, and how the uh, uh, particularly the young military who uh, 
embraced it and, and really thought they were almost pacifists because they believed that this was going to end the war. Uh, so uh, Malcolm Gladwell did a great book last year on this called Palma Mafia. And, really? And, 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 I read it. Yeah, yeah. And, and how the, you know, ultimately they couldn't pinpoint the bombing enough, so they essentially turned it over to the saturation bombing yeah. with Westmoreland. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. Excellent. Quick read, but an excellent book. Yeah. 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 Really. Yeah. There were a couple of things there I hadn't, uh, you know, I hadn't had the perspective that, uh, yeah. Yeah, look, there's so much. I mean, you know, that's why I've, I've, I have a little concern speaking to you. I know everyone out here has this pool of knowledge of uh, World War II and the like, and maybe not first-hand knowledge, like we heard about the penicillin trials, but, but I know it's all out there. It's uh, mm -hmm. kept a lot of us going. So. Uh, and, uh, finally, I, I felt a little bit like uh, I was getting away with something. Here I was, I only spent nine years of my life in the period of time I'm writing about now. But, but I spent my whole life growing up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fred.